So I have to give a little disclosure. I am um, married to a cardiologist, and so um, my research topic of interest uh, kind of developed because I spent my days doing bariatric surgery and then my nights having to talk to my husband about heart failure, and it seemed like the best combination of efforts to combine these two. Um, so uh, this is a, a disease process that may not be quite as familiar um, to some of uh, the surgeons and um, providers in the room, so I'm going to give a brief background. Um, diabetic cardiomyopathy is characterized by abnormal cardiac both structure and function, and it's really supposed to be a diagnosis that's in the absence of other cardiac risk factors. So this is disease that's independent of a coronary artery disease, of hypertension, of alveolar disease, and really the etiology is initiated from the diabetic status. Uh, it occurs quite frequently in um, type 2 diabetic patients, and interestingly, is a little more prevalent in women than men. Um, and the uh, progression usually starts with abnormal, abnormal intracellular signaling and fibrosis with hypertrophy of the left ventricle that then progresses to um, what the cardiologists call HEFPEF, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So it's a disease primarily of diastolic dysfunction and abnormal relaxation, although patients can have acute heart failure exacerbations. And then as the disease progresses, they go to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with compromised systolic function. Um, transitioning this to another similar but distinct en entity is obesity cardiomyopathy. So again, this is supposed to be a disease process that's independent of other etiologies of heart failure, so coronary artery disease, um, hypertension. Uh, but the problem with obesity cardiomyopathy is this is our patient population. So they almost always have confounding variables that complicate their cardiomyopathy, whether that's metabolic syndrome and the diseases associated with that obstructive sleep apnea leading to pulmonary hypertension and right-sided heart failure, and then this etiology of a direct cardiotoxic effect of morbid obesity on the heart itself, with all of these eventually leading to the diagnosis of heart failure. So when I'm going to talk about um, the disease process for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to lump these two together because at its core, whether or not there's systemic hyperglycemia, at the myocyte level, there's cardiac insulin resistance in both of these disease processes. And you can see it results in a significant amount of dysfunction at the myocyte level and inflammation leading to cardiac fibrosis and hypertrophy and then eventual diastolic and systolic dysfunction. So over 40 years ago, Martin Alpert, a cardiologist, um, began to report on the effect of bariatric surgery on cardiac function. Um, and this is one of the initial studies. This was in 1985 in a cohort of 62 patients who had a VBG. And um, in a small subset of those patients who had uh, uh, impaired systolic function, they saw a significant improvement in fractional shortening by echocardiogram, decreased chamber size so the hearts were less dilated, and improved hypertension. And over the uh, 20 years after that, um, we started to see occasional reports in the literature at uh, kind of quaternary centers <laughs> where cardiologists would have a patient with metabolic cardiomyopathy who would need um, either um, a mechanical support device and were BMI ineligible even for an LVAD placement or um, on inotropic support, mechanical circulatory support, and were ineligible uh, for listing for cardiac transplantation who would be preferred for bariatric surgery. And then uh, there would be case reports of these patients actually having substantial improvement in cardiac function following bariatric surgery. Um, so one of the uh, kind of first papers with a, a larger for this um, uh, topic um, was uh, 14 patients out of um, the Pittsburgh group. Um, and they found that 50% of patients who have severe cardiomyopathy um, had a significant improvement in their cardiac function following bariatric surgery. And you can see here in a subsequent um, publication, uh, they uh, developed a control group who were BMI matched and then um, function maxed by a systolic function. And in the bariatric surgery group on the left, they have a significant improvement in injection fraction from 22% to 35% postoperatively uh, with um, no significant increase in the control group. 
This also is, uh, correlates to improved symptoms in heart failure patients. So at one year following surgery, uh, when you uh, classify them by the New York Heart Association classification, for the controls on the left, you see um, a uh, increase in the severity of their um, NYHA classification with the vast majority of that group now being in stage a class four. Uh, and in the bariatric surgery group, we see the opposite where there's significant improvement in their symptom scores. A more recent publication um, echoes this finding uh, where they looked at uh, ED visits due directly to heart failure um, uh, uh, exacerbations on a diagnosis code. And you can see that after surgery, there's a significant improvement in the utilization of the emergency department related to heart failure exacerbations, suggesting an improvement in symptom control and function in these patients. When we look a little bit more granular at what's happening at the um, cardiac geometry, the heart on the left represents the metabolic cardiomyopathy heart. So these patients, due to uh, massive morbid obesity, um, will have an increased cardiac output and stroke volume, left ventricular hypertrophy to compensate, impaired diastolic relaxation, and left ventricular dilation. And just as a, a review of multiple publications that have come out looking at either echocardiograms or MRIs after bariatric surgery, we see decreased left ventricular mass, a decreased um, end diastolic diameter as well as uh, end diastolic volume, and improved relaxation. So IVRT is an isovolumetric relaxation time. So when both valves are closed, how quickly can the heart uh, relax? And you want that to be a lower number. So. So I'm going to transition um, to more the theme of this talk and looking at um, how is bariatric surgery impacting uh, uh, metabolic cardiomyopathy and is weight loss required. So this is the heart of the question in my laboratory at MCW. Um, and there, there's probably two huge forces going on. So the first one is that significant weight loss, as Martin Alpert found in the 1980s, probably um, is a, a big important factor in how the hearts are improving. So when you decrease the body mass, um, that certainly decreases the need for that huge cardiac output in these patients. And then also there's improvement in multiple other confounding comorbidities, right? So type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, all of those are impacting cardiac function. But there could be the potential for there to be a unique relationship, and this is kind of a new evolving term in cardiac literature of what we're calling the intracardiac axis. So that's crosstalk between the gastrointestinal tract and the cardiovascular system um, that could have a beneficial effect on the heart outside of weight loss. And um, Dr. Cummings uh, showed the slide on potential mechanisms. Um, some more attractive might include the microbiome or changes in GI hormones um, or bile acids. Um, so this is some unpublished data from our laboratory. On the left-hand side, um, we have four uh, groups, and this, this is rodent data. And uh, I'll tell you, heart failure is such a complex disease that um, taking this back to rodents becomes very attractive because you can weight match them, food match them, comorbidity match them. So this is an obese sucker rat. It's a model of metabolic syndrome and um, cardiac dysfunction. And um, the most important two groups to compare are the sleeve gastrectomy to the pear-fed animals. So these are animals that were dieted to the sleeve gastrectomy group, lost the same amount of weight, um, and you compare the two outcomes between the two for weight loss independent mechanisms. And what we see on the right is systolic function. So sleeve gastrectomy rats had preserved systolic function um, after surgery. Every other group, including our lean group, had age um, a decompensation in their ejection fractions. We also saw a significant improvement in diastolic dysfunction that's weight loss independent. So this is measured by isovolumetric relaxation time, a significant decrease in the amount of time it takes for the left ventricle to dilate after surgery, only seen in the sleeve gastrectomy animals. They have preserved heart weight body weights, and uh, this almost matches the lean sham control. Um, so where the obese pear fed and the ad lib um, sham groups, their heart weight actually decreases compared to their body mass. We see preservation of that in the sleeve gastrectomy animals. And then when we look more specifically at intracellular signaling, we're seeing some interesting changes in myo probably myocyte uh, substrate utilization and also stress-induced pathways. So we have a decrease in P38 MAP kinase in the sleeve gastrectomy animals compared to the pear-fed, and changes in GLUT1 expression, um, the glu <coughs> glucose transporter for taking glucose into the cell. 
So we're seeing multiple different changes um, in this pathophysiology induced by sleeve gastrectomy. We haven't done this in bypass um, animals. I suspect it would probably be more profound on an insulin signaling level, an inflammatory and stress level, and it's resulting in weight loss independent improvement in diastolic and systolic function. Uh, in uh, respect to Dr. Paris, um, this was, you know, something that really started with the diabetes concept and trying to understand how we're getting this dramatic improvement in type 2 diabetes. But I think there's multiple disease processes that we're now expanding this to, and, and this is a really exciting one where um, we see this dramatic clinical effect of bariatric surgery on cardiac function, but we're just beginning to touch the surface of the mechanisms. So in summary, bariatric surgery um, does seem to significantly improve cardiac geometry and function in patients with metabolic cardiomyopathy. They're likely weight loss dependent, but also multiple weight loss independent mechanisms. And the exciting part about this as a metabolic surgeon is that gives us the potential to manipulate the intracardiac access either through surgery, through unique surgeries, through pharmacotherapy that can improve heart failure way beyond the obesity status of the patient. Thank you.